how then, and this kind of goes with, I think probably the average person reading along text and, you know, you see it's all caps or something like that. And it's quoting the old Testament or it's, you know, as the scriptures say or something. Yep. Like that. And a lot of times it, it's, it's square. It's almost a one-to-one, but there are other times that you go back to it and you're like Isaiah 53, or you look <laughs> at this thing or Jeremiah or a Psalm and you're like, or even, I mean, we're memorizing Psalm eight with the kids right now. And you have made him a little lower than God. It says in Psalm eight, but in Hebrews, it says you made him a little lower than the angels. Now is the author of Hebrews quoting directly? I mean, maybe I can ask you now, is Hebrews a sermon? Is that, is that correct? Most people believe it could a well sermon. be. Yes. Okay. And so obviously I preach, I'm a pastor. You know, you've, you've certainly preached many times and taught and stuff. You're going to say something. So do you think right there, though he's under the inspiration of the spirit, explain a little bit, even like, you know, the, the, I think I forget where it is in the old Testament, but out of Egypt, I called my son, but then is it Matthew or is it Luke that uses that talking Matthew, about Christ? Yeah. Matthew. So Matthew references that as a prophecy about <clears throat> Jesus, but in the old Testament, it it's like, how do I wait? Is that talking about Jesus? What's he, what's Matthew doing when he's kind of taking these Old Testament texts or the author of Hebrews or somebody like that? What what's going on there when they're they yeah. seem to be playing fast and loose with the Bible and therefore you know us twenty first century Americans we like everything in a box like oh mm-hmm. that's not that's not good and then somebody else looks at that and says yeah that's why I reject the Bible and Jesus I don't I, it's all a mess I don't like it it's contradictions what, what well is, you what's can going probably on still put it in a box you just have to change the boxes <laughs> yeah. um those are actually two two very good examples because they sort of get at um the two major kinds of questions that we need to ask um the first example um the psalm 8 one has to do with um when a new testament writer whose writings we have only in greek um refers to an old testament passage that is identifiable were they looking at a Greek copy. Um, We call it the Septuagint. (coughs) And then either copying it verbatim or uh, editing it in some way. Were they looking at the Hebrew Mm. and then making their own translation into Greek? Um. And then that question subdivides because more than one version of the Septuagint has been discovered Mm -hmm. and there are minor differences among those versions. The discovery of portions uh, of every Old Testament book except Esther in the Hebrew uh, copies of the Bible found at the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a window into what is at times a thousand years older Hebrew than we previously had access to. And sometimes the uh, results are that uh, the later Hebrew is remarkably similar to what we find at Qumran, at the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but sometimes it's remarkably different. Hmm. Um, So would a first century Christian have been reading a Hebrew text that looked more like what we find among the Dead Sea Scrolls than among the later so-called Masoretic texts? So all of those reflect one cluster of questions that you have to address. And sometimes it's as simple as realizing that uh, the Hebrew Elohim, which can mean God, but it is a plural and it can also mean small g gods, can in various contexts inside and outside of the Bible also mean angels. So um, interesting. Okay. Somebody, uh, whoever wrote Hebrews had reason to think that angels was uh, 
the right way to take that passage and, and made his point on that basis. The other kind of question that you bring up <clears throat> is once I have a pretty good idea of the passage a New Testament writer is citing and in what version, what form of interpretation, what form of hermeneutic um, is he employing? There are plenty of texts that we often think of as prophetic. <clears throat> a New Testament writer will use the language of fulfillment um, that say something is going to happen in the future in the Old Testament. And the New Testament says, hey, guess what? It happened. Um, probably related to something having to do with Jesus. But there are also plenty of texts that imply every bit as common and well understood uh, interpretive principle in those days that has come to be known as typology, um, a type, a pattern, um, where the New Testament writer who has already come to believe in Jesus who is now writing to fellow Christians, trying to give them Christian truth and teaching, sees in something that was very theologically significant in the Old Testament, often having to do with creation or redemption. Look at that. Hosea 11.1 1 which, by the way, right in that verse tells us he's talking about Israel, mm -hmm. not Jesus. Right. Not using any future tense verbs, not making any predictions, using past tense narrative, says, out of Egypt, I called my son. The collective people of Israel when they left <coughs> Egypt at the time of the Exodus. So what's going on in Matthew's head? Well, I imagine it like this. Huh. When God gave his original covenant to his people, he did so in the context of a dramatic rescue, something unlike anything they had seen in at least 400 years but something which throughout our Jewish history has come to be recognized as, as the paradigm, as the classic example. You, you can't get any better than this if you want to talk about God redeeming his people. Mm, yeah. All you have to do is say, hey, Richard, you feel like you need to come out of Egypt? And if you're in the know, you know that I'm saying you look like you have a headache. You want to get over that. <laughs> um, now, along comes a man who did enough to convince us that he was the anointed Messiah. And there's this bizarre little story that we learned of how he and his family had to escape Israel to go to Egypt when he was about two years old. Mm. And then, because they didn't want to stay living there when it was safe, they came out of Egypt. Mm. And this is the man who, among all the different titles people are calling him, one of them is the Son of God. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now I start to hear eerie music playing in the background. <laughs> nee, 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 nee. No, this is spooky. Yeah. This isn't just coincidence. This is a sign of God's providential patterns of acting in history. Mm. And we're meant to notice it. Gotcha. No, that's good. I think, okay, that's really helpful uh, because, yeah. again, so I think sometimes people will just you know, they'll either brush past it and not really ask, 
you know, for fear of there's not an answer or a good answer or, oh, no, this means there's a contradiction or or man is superseding God or the Bible is just written by human hands and not superintended and carried along by the Holy Spirit speaking from God. And so I think but again, that goes back to what we were speaking a while ago with with faith. You're still taking these things as faith. And I mean, I often will say like, well, what's say the Bible is just man's opinion then. What else do you have? You don't have some other real thing that's contending. I mean, maybe some Muslims might say, no, the Quran is, is God's word or something. Sure. But most people, especially skeptics and just kind of wishy-washy, good American Western people who just want to live a quote unquote good life. They don't have anything else. You know, the works of Dar- Dawkins or Darwin or, or, or Hawking or anybody else. This isn't God's word. This isn't really going to help you and really show you who you are, why you have a problem that there's a solution to your problem. And then that solution is not you, but God himself. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, these things, you're still, you're still out of luck as it were, as the phrase goes. And, you know, so there, there is a level of like, well, I trust God that this is his word as well. Right. I mean, because, you know, if we're proving everything, which sometimes apologetics can go a little too far in my estimation, where you're trying to prove everything. It's like, well, at the end of the day, I'm still going to believe that Jesus, I never saw him. I never saw him born. You didn't see him born. Nobody living today. Nobody even saw him resurrect, even in his day. Right. So but they still believe it. And like you just said, and that's a good point, that he God is acting in history. And there's a real we're not talking about Gnostic, where you know Jesus is God in a body, or he's floating around, or he only appeared to be God, or it's just an illusion, or any of these other things. We're talking about real second person Godhead adding humanity to himself. And then not just doing it on Thursday and getting crucified Friday and then leaving on Sunday, but for 30 some odd years and then hanging out for another 40 days afterward just to prove to everybody, OK, this is me. Or I'm going to go now because, you know, 40 days, biblical number, all that. Like it's it's once you kind of really lay it on the table, it it I think it's encouraging and exciting personally. So um, sounds like you're a good preacher. <laughs> well, I try to be. I hope I am. <laughs> 